Welcome everybody, my name's Will, one of the pastors here, and just glad to have everybody here this morning. Well, this is a beautiful day today, sun's out, a lot better than the rain yesterday. So we're in a series on Psalms, and uh, the neat thing about this is each of us pastors got to pick one of our favorite Psalms to share with. So I picked, uh, I got two really favorite Psalms, Psalm 1 and uh, Psalm 107. Psalm 1's all about wisdom. But Psalm 107 is all about redemption. And uh, so I just wanted to share that with you guys this morning. And uh, let's pray before we dive into this. Should we do that? God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, all the folks that wrote the Psalms uh, just such a long time ago, but uh, were in awe of you and uh, the mighty things that you do. And we're honest, too, about where they were in life and what was happening to them. And so I know everybody's got different things that have been going on in their lives this week, Father. But God, help us just take a deep breath and uh, listen to your spirit and uh, listen to what you have to say for us through your word as well too, God. And I just pray that this morning would be honoring to you. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Michael, I'll take that next slide. So uh, what have you been talking about these days? Huh? What is it? What's been going on? So uh, I, w- I always finish my slides up like at 2 a.m. because I want to get to the absolute latest stuff. So, uh, so this was what was on the news. Stop. Sarah's shaking her head. There's no sense of preparing ahead of time because Christ may return, you know, and then you put all that work in for something you didn't have to worry about. So um, let's see what's on the news here. Give me the next slide. Wow. This is right off of the New York Times front page article. Things, price is going up, right? Gas food, rent, pretty much everything right now, and uh, that may not be stopping. What else is in the news? B5, anybody know that, that number, right? Omicron B5 variant, that's our new most prevalent variant in the United States, and uh, people are worried about what's going to come out of the next B5 and how many people are getting it, and I don't know if you may start seeing masks come back in different places, and uh, Man, this is a thing, this is a gift that keeps on giving, right? It just isn't going to end at any time soon. Give me that next slide there. Yeah. Putin made a great statement yesterday. He said, hey, you think this has been a war? He says, we haven't even started yet. He said, we're just getting started. And uh, so that war in the uh, Europe is grinding on, and it looks like it's going to be grinding on for years, possibly, uh, and just chewing up people. It's just uh, the threshing floor of war and will not end. And it's not the only place that's going on. It's going on in Somalia, in Burma, and a lot of other places around the world right now. Some, some we don't talk about here, but it doesn't mean that they're not happening. Yeah. What else? Let's see what else is there. Americans are really upset with each other in a lot of different ways. And uh, we're going to hear a lot more about how upset we are with each other through the fall and in the election season. And it isn't going to end on that ballot day in November. It's going to go on and on and on. And uh, it's dividing families right now. A lot of the tensions and things that are going on, it's dividing friendships. And uh, it'll, it'll keep on happening too. Go ahead and give me that next one. And then we keep on getting peppered with all these times that people uh, vent their anger and frustration and hatred and despair uh, on people in their neighborhoods. And it just seems like it pops up all over the place. And so while we're dealing with all that, these things keep on happening too. So that that was the news this morning. And that's just today right? Yeah. And we talk about a lot of these things, but uh, it doesn't seem like there's much hope in any of that, right? But that's, that's what's on the front page of all the papers. So give, give me that next one there. And in the midst of that, here comes Psalm 107. This is the first line from that psalm. It says, give thanks to the Lord. And you have to kind of look from all those newspaper articles and say, well, what's, what in the world 
is there to give thanks to the Lord for? I mean, I can't afford to go buy anything. I can't afford to drive anywhere. Okay? I can't afford to talk to my neighbor about anything because we're all uptight about everything, right? I'm worried about my kids at school and what's going to be happening to them when they show up there. And it just goes on and on. What's, so what's to be thankful? But listen, listen to what it says. For he is good. He is good. None of that changed with all the rest of this stuff. Listen what else it says. In the next verse he says, His faithful love endures forever. And in the original text, the word endures wasn't there. We kind of need that in English. What it really says is his faithful love forever. (laughs) And you know, in the midst of all these tragedies and all these things going on, God's faithful love to us forever. And you know what? That love is the same that it was yesterday and last month and a hundred years ago, and a thousand years ago, and it's the same that's going to happen today, and it'll be there ten years from now, and a thousand years from now as well. It's the same faithful love. So that's how the psalmist starts off with this, right? Let's see where he takes it from there. Go ahead. Hmm. So he's not, he's not getting into the government, and he's not getting into prices, and he's not getting into war, and he's not getting into all the other hassles. He says, let's talk about what your real problem was that he's been really faithful with. He says, has the Lord redeemed you? And that redemption was from being lost and in despair far away from God. Under God's judgment for all the stupid things you and I have done, right? That's what redemption means. You know, you have, we have a place in town where you can get redeemed. You know where that is? It's the pawn shop, right next to the coffee shop downtown, right? So you can go in there, and people have, what do you do at a pawn shop? You ain't got enough money, so what do you do? You take your lawnmower or your, st- your stereo or your friend's stereo, right? And you take it in there, and you get some cash for it. But if you want it back, what do you got to do? You got to pay the price, right? To redeem it back, to bring it back, right? That's what redemption is, yeah. And we had a price on our head none of us can pay. And God says, guess what? I paid the price and I redeemed you. I purchased you back into my family. And so the psalmist says, in the midst of all these other things that are going on, he says, have you been redeemed? Have you been redeemed? Then guess what he says? He says, don't be quiet about it. We're talking about everything else. But we don't talk about it. He says, then speak out. He says, tell others. He has redeemed you from your enemies, right? You may go, well, I'm not fighting a war right now. Who's my enemy? Well, we all have an enemy, and his name is Lucifer, right? Okay? And he he desperately wants to see us stay as far away from God as we possibly can, and he wants us to be as condemned as he is, and he is our enemy. And God says, and matter of fact, that pawn shop that we all sold ourselves for all the stupid things we did, right? was owned by who? Lucifer, right? We read about it in Ephesians. We're part of the family of the kingdom of the ruler of the air. That's, that's Lucifer. We don't like thinking about that, right? But that's who we all were. We were in Satan's pawn shop, and he owned us. And he was our enemy. And guess what? God redeemed us from our enemy. He purchased us back from him. And God says, <laughs> we need to remember that, and we need to tell other people about that. That we got redeemed from an enemy we had no power to overcome. He says, for he has gathered the exiles from many lands. From the east and the west and from the north and the south. And we talk about wars and famines and all those kind of things. But a lot of times we don't talk about the fact that God is redeeming people in Russia. And he's redeeming people in Somalia and in Egypt and in Australia and in South Africa, in Sierra Leone, and all over the world. Every day, he redeems people. And all the things that all the presidents and prime ministers and everything else in the world wants to do can't stop God's redemption of his people, right? (laughs) Every day, more and more. 
people are coming to him. But we're part of that group that's been redeemed. And God says, if you've been redeemed, then you need to speak out and not be silent about it. Because you're part of this family that God has gathered together, right? Yeah, let's keep looking. I want to talk about some of the types of things that God has re redeemed us. And this isn't Will speaking. This is right out of what God put he, in this psalm. Because he wants people to remember what God has done. He wants us to remember what God has done for us. So, so he, 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 the psalmist says, remember how you used to live. Remember what terrible situation you were in. Because we forget, right? We got the struggles of this week gets in our way. Friday night, I lost my wallet. I got no idea where it is. I've looked all over my truck, I've looked all over my house, I've looked over my yard, and it's gone. So, what do you know? So, that means I don't have any ID, and I don't have any bank cards, and I don't, I'm kind of free, because I, I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore, right? But, you know, it'd be easy to get kind of caught up in the middle of that, right? And it does, we get caught up in those things, right? And God says, don't forget your redemption in the midst of the goofy things that go on in life, because those are going to happen every day, right? So I want us to take a look at some of these kind of things. And I want you to think about, wow, is this talking about me? Is this what God redeemed me from? And when have I, when have I talked to anybody else about this? When's the last time I shared with anybody else about God, how God redeemed me? So I want you to listen, but think about, man, this is, this is maybe something that happened to me. So the first thing the psalmist gets into is he says, God redeems us from an empty, lonely, abandoned life where we feel like we're out there all on our own and nobody else is with us. And let's read that scripture that goes with that. Go ahead, give me that next slide. He says, some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless and hungry and thirsty. What's a wilderness? That's where you are all by yourself, okay, with no resources, and there's no help, and there's no hope. And what does he say? And they nearly died. But God says, when we were willing to cry out, after trying everything else, we cry out to God. Listen, he says, Lord, help. They cried their trouble. And he rescued. Now, who's the he? It's God. He rescued them in their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is your story. Maybe you can look back at a chunk of time in your life where you felt like you were just completely isolated and had no help from anybody else. And you had to call out to God, and he rescued you. God says, yeah, that's right, because that's what I do. But he says, have you told anybody about that? <laughs> right? Have you shared that with anybody? Maybe you know it, but maybe you haven't talked about it. Let's keep going. Maybe you were depressed. Maybe you were obsessed with something you couldn't get away from it. Maybe you were in despair. Maybe you were just completely frustrated by the situation you found yourself in. Well, let's see what God talks about that situation. Some sat in darkness and in deepest gloom imprisoned in the iron chains of not some government but of misery the iron chains of misery and they rebelled against the words of God scorning the counsel of the most high because a lot of times when you're in the middle of a mess you're still telling God I'm going to take care of it I'm going to figure this thing out I'm going to deal with it myself right That is why he broke them with hard labor. And they fell, and no one was there to help them. That's not a good place to be. It's not, it's not a good place to be. And they said, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. And he led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom. 
and he snapped their chains. <laughs> Which couldn't be broken by anybody else, but by who? The creator of the universe is not put back by the chains that we forged for ourselves, right? Okay? Once we put them together, we may not have been able to take them apart, but the creator of the universe has no problem with that. He led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom. And he snapped their chains. He broke down their prison gates of bronze. And he cut apart the bars of iron that held him back. Hmm. And maybe you felt like that, that you were caught up in something you had absolutely no control over, you couldn't do a thing about. And God saved you out of that. Well, God says, yes, he does that because that's who he is, right? But have you told anybody about that? Have you shared that with anybody? Let's look at another group of folks. Sometimes we got to be redeemed from the consequences of our foolishness because we know there's a God. That's what we're studying in Romans. It's, it's apparent to all of us from the creation of the universe and we give God the Heisman and say, no, I'm going to go do my own thing in my own way, right? And guess what? When you live the fool, you get to reap the fool, and things happen in your lives. Let's read the rest of the psalm here. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help. They're standing in the rope. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. And he sent out his word, and he healed them, snatching them from the door of death. You know, so we can, we can play the fool and do foolish, stupid things to the point of death. And God says, I can redeem you from that if you will turn to me. Listen to what he says. He, he sent his word and he healed them, snatching them from the door of death because he says, death is no problem for me because I have victory over death, right? Not a problem. If you will turn to me, I can redeem you. Let's look at another group of folks. Redeemed from finding happiness and worldly success. And they say, well, whoa, wait a second. This is the American dream, right? We're supposed to do really well. And things happen really well for us, right? Work hard. Everything comes out of that. And God says, no, guess what? I've, I've redeemed you from that. It's kind of like, well, wait a second. I don't know that I want to be redeemed from that. Well, let's, let's see what, what he's talking about here. Some, some went off to sea in ships plying the trade routes of the world. Why were they doing that? Because that's where you made your money, right? Took a lot of work to get the ships together and get your crew together, go do the trade, and become wealthy. Seemed like that's a pretty good thing. And well, let's see what God's response to that is. They too observed the Lord's power in action. And that power wasn't just helping them make more money and getting more wind in their sails and helping them do more trade. Guess, guess what God did with his power? This is what he had to say. He says, they too observe the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. And you say, well, that's pretty cool. I'm out there sailing. I love watching what's going on. Let's see what his impressive works were here. Yeah. And he spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. And their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. And the sailors cringed in terror. And they reeled and staggered like drunkards. They weren't drunk, but they act like drunkards because they had no control over anything. In the midst of just trying to become wealthy. And they were at their wit's end. And finally they did what? Lord, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. And he calmed the storm to a whisper 
and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness <laughs> after all of the rest of it, right? As he brought them to safety into harbor. You know, God can redeem us of the foolishness of chasing after position and wealth and fame and making that an idol before him. He can redeem us from that. And some of you have been redeemed from that. And the question is, have you told anybody? Remember how we start the psalm off? If you've been redeemed, share this, <laughs> right? Because the world's sharing all other kind of stuff. And God is calling for us to share this. Give me that next slide. <clears throat> this is the, this, after each of these different situations, this first set of verses happens, and I put a compilation of a few of the other ones. But after every one of these situations, it says, let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he's done for them. Every one of those. Because <laughs> they didn't do it. And you didn't do it. And I didn't do it. None of us redeemed ourselves, right? God redeemed, and every one of our situations was different, where God pulled us out of there. But he says, instead of getting caught up in all the rest of the hassle of life, are you taking time to step back and tell God, thank you. Thank you, right? It's one of the reasons we do communion here the first Sunday of each month, is for us to remember that we all desperately were far away from God and needed redemption. And none of us here could figure out how to do that on our own. And Christ on that cross came and made that payment for us. Because we couldn't pay the price to get out of the Satan's pawn shop. Right? Where we put ourselves. And Christ said, my blood will purchase you. And take you out of that hell that you put yourself in far away from God. And it just didn't set you out in the street and say, well, you're pretty miserable. At least you're not with Satan anymore. He says, no, no, no. I took you out of there and I put you with my family. And Satan, who was a created being who got to observe the Trinity and the fellowship of the Trinity, but never to participate in it, saw us redeemed from his kingdom and placed in the fellowship of the Trinity of God. Remember, he says, I now call you my children. No longer slaves. He says, I call you friends and brothers, right? That's what the angels are in awe of because they don't get to, even though they are in the presence of the living God every day, they observe the fellowship of the Trinity, but they don't get to participate in it. But we do. If you've been redeemed, you now get to boldly come into the presence of God, it says in Hebrews, at any moment, because why? Not because we've earned it, but because we're part of his family. And he wants to have us there with him, right? Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he's done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And he broke down their prison gates of bronze. And he cut apart their bars of iron. How he blesses them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. Put your name in there if you've been redeemed. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, but if you know you've been redeemed, stick your own name in there, right? What would that look like if Walt said, let Walt praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things God has done for Walt. For he satisfies Walt's thirst and he fills Walt's hunger with good things and he broke down Walt's prison gates of bronze, right? What if he's talking to Phil and he cut apart the bars of iron that imprison Phil. How he blesses Phil. Let Phil exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the litters of the nation. I just picked two guys up. I could pick anybody out here, right? Because this is our story, 
right? This is our story <laughs> that we forget about and we get wrapped up in the gas prices and the food prices and the politics and the chaos and all the other things and whichever new flavor of Omicron is coming out again, right? We're caught up in all that stuff. And we forget about this. We don't put our name in here anymore. Let's keep going. <laughs> and you know what the psalmist says? He says, don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> right? He says, tell it to the world. So when's the last time that you've told somebody your story? Because everybody here in this room who knows Christ has a story of redemption. And you know what? It's not a singular redemption. God is redeeming us every day, right? Every day there's a new story of that redemption that we can talk about. You can talk to your kids about it. You can talk to your grandkids about it. You can talk to your spouse about it. You can talk to your neighbors about it. When you stop at Speedway, you can talk to the person behind the counter. They're really tired of hearing from me. Okay? <laughs> but I talk to them about it. There's a greeter at Walmart. Guess what? You can stop right there and tell them because they're not leaving. <laughs> they have to talk to you because they're being paid. All right, good. They get to hear the story of redemption, right? Let's keep going. The last part of this psalm, and I'm not going to read all the verses. You can do it. This is a paraphrase. Uh, there's a gal who did a, a paraphrase of the whole book of Psalms. And I just love how she thought about this. And so I'm just going to read you her paraphrase here. But I want you to think about what she's saying here. He says, let the multitudes hear of your discovery let them know that God is near, that he may rejoice in his everlasting and ever-present love. That they may rejoice, right? It is the lack of God in people's lives that drives them up and turns them into dust. And after all those things we seek after and try and do, without God, we are just dust, we're nothing else. That's why I love Psalm 1. He says, as we seek after our own things, he says, we're like the chaff of the grain, right? Most of us don't ever go out to a farm. We drive by the wheat fields, right? We see them, but we never know. If you took some of those wheat heads and you rolled them in your hand, on the outside of that seed is this little layer of thing called the husk. And it's like chaff, and you can take that. And actually, when you thresh the grain, part of what you do is roll the grain together to get the rest of it. We just blow on it. And it blows off. Because it's nothing, right? And that's what we are like without the redemption of God. In God's presence, and accept, it is God's presence and acceptance that turns on the lights and floods the dark corridors that led to nowhere, that transforms them into warm rooms where one may live in joy and fulfillment. It is the acknowledgement of a loving God that makes a forbidding world a place to live in. Because nothing else can. Nothing else will. Nothing else will redeem us. Everybody here has hard times. There's nobody here that hasn't had a hard time in the past. Maybe you're in a hard time today. And if, if you hadn't had one in the past and today, you are guaranteed to have one in the future. Trust me. Okay? Okay? And part of what you just got to decide is, is God redeeming this moment or not? Or maybe he has redeemed you through a lot of this, but you've just forgotten about it because you're all caught up in today. And you're not praising him for what he's done and how he's redeemed you already. And you're not talking about that. You're talking about everything else. And God says, Stop. Remember these things and talk about them and be in awe of who God is. Give me the next slide. So I want to tell you a couple of my stories of redemption. Because hmm. there was a time when I was <laughs> wandering in the desert, feeling really alone. 
Okay? Let's picture my son Andy. Ten years old, there in that picture. That was the morning before we went to uh, Bait and Children's. Andy had cancer, malignant melanoma, and uh, they'd already took a chunk of his back out where the cancer was. And we're going down, and they're going to take out an even bigger part of his back. And take out all the lymph nodes out of the sides of his chest in a desperate measure to try and stop the cancer. So that was 4 o'clock that morning before we headed down for that surgery. And we found a guy in Pittsburgh through my current daughter-in-law's dad that says, we got a great new treatment for melanoma, for malignant melanoma, immunotherapy. And we thought, great, this is going to be life-saving. And we heard about what it's been doing in other kids. And, you know, at the time, Andy had this cancer. There were only like 35 kids in the whole country that had malignant melanoma. And back then, if you had malignant melanoma, it's like you got three months to live because there's no treatment. There's nothing to happen, okay? Because it, it just spread fast and it didn't respond to anything. And we got in that new treatment. But you know what? I was a pretty smart guy and I figured, hey, I want to stay up with all this stuff. So my son was in medical school and I got his password for all the medical journals and I read them all about melanoma. I read everything I could find. I said, I'm, I'm, there's nothing in my life I haven't been able to take care of up to this point, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work this thing, and I'm going to help my son. And you know what I discovered when I read about this Dr. Kirkwood in Pittsburgh that's supposed to have this life-saving thing? I watched one of his videos from a presentation that he gave in, uh, in Europe, and he says, yeah, this thing's amazing. We've been giving this to adults, and we've extended their, their average lifespan from three months to six months. Well, we'd met with him two or three times. He never mentioned that to us. And I thought, oh, surely this must be wrong. So I read all of his journals entries on this thing, and I went through all the math and everything else. And yeah, that's pretty much what had happened. Now, the doctors thought that was pretty amazing because at that point, they couldn't do anything for anybody. Right? And I remember 3 o'clock one morning, I'm reading all this stuff. And I've been reading and reading and reading and talking to doctors and doing my own study on cell therapy and biology and all these kind of things. And I remember sitting there thinking, there is nothing I can do about this. <laughs> and it doesn't look like there's anything anybody else can do about this either. And I remember I had to stop and say, God, I am just along for the ride. Okay, and I don't know where you're taking us. I don't know what the next three months looks like. I thought I did. I thought I knew exactly what was going to happen. I don't know anymore, right? And I had to admit that, God, I have no power over this, but you are in control, and my son belongs to you, right? And you've entrusted him to Kim and I for a while. And I don't know if that's going to end in three months, if that's going to go on longer. And I had to cry out to God that morning because it didn't matter how much more I studied or talked to or pursued. The only path I had was to cry out to God. Yeah. Now, there are times with parents where God says, I've given you this child for a period of time and I'm going to take him back, right? Because you're just a steward. Sometimes it's longer. In our case, we had Andy over last night, stopped by the house with his wife and his little girl. And uh, he's with us. And we have other folks in our church here who face similar situations. And God says, no, I'm going to take them back to be with me. But God says, I am always present in those situations. 
but he calls us to lean on him and not on ourselves. Okay? Because we're leaning on ourselves all the time. And God says, lean on me. Lean on me. And God taught me a lot through that situation to stop. But he wasn't done because I was, Will Urschel was doing an awful lot of leaning on himself, okay? And he whacked some of the snot out of me there. <laughs> but he wasn't done yet. He needed to do some more. Give me the next slide. Anybody know what this plane is here? This is an F-35A. This is our newest stealth fighter. We got lots of them. This is a $1.7 trillion program. I didn't say billion, I said trillion. This is probably the most expensive weapon system ever dreamed up by the United States of America, okay? And in 20, 2011, a year after we started, a couple years after we started Andy's treatments and he was doing really well, I was sitting there at the headquarters, Air Force Material Command, and I was the tech director there, and I got a call and says, Will, you need to come to this meeting. I said, okay. And it's with the, with the, with the boss, and the boss was the four-star. I said, okay. So I went up there, and I'm sitting around, and I'm in this conference room, and we got 10 different four-stars from all over the country linked up, and we got not only Air Force four-stars, we got four-star admirals, admirals from the Navy, because back in 2011, the Navy was running this program. And they we're talking about canceling this thing because it was in so much trouble. And they've been trying to get this thing going for 15 years, and it wasn't happening. And the biggest problem was they couldn't make any software work on the plane. They had 8 million lines of code on the plane, and it wasn't working. And the Navy pretty much said, we need to give up, cancel the program, and start all over again. And the Air Force generals put all the Navy admirals on mute and said, we're not doing that. <laughs> so. My boss looked over me and says, okay, Will, you're going to go fix this. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, great. That sounds like, what, why, why wouldn't you want it done by, right? Okay. So for the next four years, I stopped everything else in life and went and worked this problem. And uh, this was every day of every week. I was traveling 100 times a year, okay, and... I dropped out of everything. Dropped out of my family. I dropped out of the church. I dropped out of the community because this was like job number one. Okay, and this program was in a nosedive, and you're sitting there just pulling on everything to try and get it out of there to keep it from crashing. It felt like it was going to crash every week. But three years later, we started delivering planes with software that worked. And we made promises about when things were going to happen, and they actually started happening, and the program survived. And, uh, you know, when you're in the middle of something that's moving really fast, it's hard to get off, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to step off of a Ferrari when it's going at 120 miles an hour and say, I'm just going to get off of this thing. Well, this program was a Ferrari. It was moving that fast. And all of us who were working on this thing felt really good about it because we had saved this thing, Right? And uh, we, we built, I don't know, about 700 of these things. It's being used by 13 different nations in the world, and it's replacing all the F-16s for the Air Force and all the Harriers for the Marine Corps and, and a bunch of planes for the Navy as well, too, as well as a whole bunch of folks in, around the world. And I thought, okay, this is great. I'm, I'm part of something really good, and I'm going to stay with it, and it's, I'm doing great. And then in the middle of all this, we changed all of the leaders in the program. And I got a new boss, and he had a new boss, and they had all these new associate bosses. And they called me in, and they said, well, this, that, was, that was okay, what got on, but we got this other big problem, and we needed this taken care of. And so I put another team together on it, we looked at it, and I came and told them, and they said, that's the wrong answer, because we can't tell that to Congress, because we've already told them something else. And I, working on my bluntness, Sarah's helping me with that. <laughs> I told my three-star general, I said, nope, I'm not saying anything else because this is what is the truth. And we're not going to go lie to a bunch of people about what's going on in this program. Okay? We're going to be honest. 
We've been honest in the past, and we worked hard, and we're going to be honest now. And that meeting did not go very well. And uh, I remember that was in Washington, D.C., and I got on a plane, and I flew down to Texas to the plant, and I met with the guys down there. We're still working the problem. And I got a phone call. I said, Will, we need you in a meeting at 6 o'clock tonight. I said, okay. So I worked the whole day and went to the meeting, and they said, you're fired. And uh, we don't need your services anymore. And uh, uh, so that's it. Do you, need, do you need more time? And I said, no, I got a ticket home tonight. I guess I'm going home. And so I walked out of the plant and I flew home. And uh, I went into the work the next day. I said, well, I'm not doing this anymore. What am I doing? And they, they gave me probably the, the job, the least desirable job I could think about <laughs> in the entire Air Force is the one they gave me. And they said, this is your new job, because they were sending a message that you don't mess around, right? And so I was going to be made an example of. And uh, I, I felt like that guy out there in the ocean, right, that thought he was out there doing all those great things, and all of a sudden, the deck falls out beneath you, right? And you're thrown up in the air, and you don't know what the heck is going on. But you know what? The next week, uh, one of the guys from the church association said, hey, we're having a city council meeting, and we need a pastor to pray at it. Would you like to do it? I said, well, I guess I can, because I don't really seem to have a job anymore. <laughs> and I went. And Sarah was there, and the other folks, and they came up afterwards. They said, Will, would you like to help out with city council? And up to that point, I'd never been home for four years on a Thursday night because I'd been in Washington or Texas or California or Boston or someplace else. But I'm home. And I said, sure, I can do that. And we started having, we had a big issue with one of our former pastors here, which I wasn't paying any attention to because I was traveling all over the world all the time. But I was able to be around. And we survived a really hard time here at church with Van and Steve and Greg and I. And I had a little bit of time to put into that. And had, at that time, three little grandkids and a wife who was getting pretty frustrated taking care of them. And now we have four, but now I got a lot more time to spend with them. And things just kept on coming on. All good things that God had planned that I couldn't be part of while I was doing this other stuff. And God had to say, it's time to stop. Now, is that the way I would have chosen to stop it? Probably not, but God knew. God redeemed me from that, okay? He redeemed me from being so consumed with something that I wasn't thinking about him anymore, okay? Restoration is what God does, okay? Those are just two examples from when God had to come and intercede with me and bring me to my knees to a place to say, God, help. And guess what? God helps. And God restores us, right? And he turns the desert into fertile land for those that are willing to humble themselves before him, right? It has nothing to do with our own actions. It's just us being willing, us to finally humble ourselves before him. And you know what? Sometimes God has to give you some really hard times to help you wake up. That's not a bad thing, because if that redeems you, that's the best thing that can happen in your life. This psalm is talking about four different situations where God brings people to really hard situations. And when they humble themselves to him and they call out, he redeems them. And their life is back. Give me that next slide. So where, where does that leave you? Well, the first thing you need to think about is, have I been redeemed? Because you can't talk about something that hasn't happened, right? Where do you and God stand? 
Are you still in that pawn shop sitting on the shelf? Or has God purchased you out of it? And you don't get to decide what the purchase price is. You don't get to decide how that transaction happens. That's all God. You just get to decide whether you accept it or not. And you have to humble yourself to say, I'm not in charge. I can't get myself out of Satan's pawn shop. I will stay here for all of eternity unless I'm willing to humble myself before God and accept his payment. And what is that? A set of verses we've all heard. I just want to read them to us again. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and his only son so that everyone who believes in him, what was the payment price? What was it? It cost God the life of his eternal son who'd been in an eternal relationship with him and the Holy Spirit for all time to take all the, all the stuff that I had done and to die to take the payment for that. Right? He says... And he says, if you're willing to accept that, not how good you are, not how good you're going to be, not what somebody else did for you, he says, there's only one thing. God says, I made the payment, you didn't. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm losing. I got it back on, guys, thanks. God says, I did it, you didn't. You're just observing this. And you got to decide, do you want to, are you willing to humble yourself to accept this or not? And listen to what he says. So that everyone who believes in him, in his death, in his payment, that that's sufficient to get you out of Satan's pawn shop and to redeem you into his family, right? Has what? Eternal life. With who? With God. As part of that family of of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right there with them, right? He says, God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That is redemption. So, I'm just asking everybody here, have you humbled yourself before God and said, yes, I know where I am, I'm hanging out with Satan as an idiot and I'm not moving from there and I desperately need you to purchase me out of there. And I accept that payment, right? And if you have, then you've been redeemed. And if you haven't, you haven't been redeemed. Now listen, it says there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. And God says, once you're out of the pawn shop, you're out of the pawn shop. Okay? Once you're part of the family, the family. Now, there's fools, family, and family act like fools. Okay? There's no fools that act like family. Okay? There's, there's family that act like fools sometimes. But you are always family when God redeems you. He says, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not accept this, listen, has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. So, this is the first question to everybody here. Have you been redeemed? And if you haven't, you don't need to, you don't need to talk about anything else. You don't need to talk about any other goodness of God or anything, because you're lost. That's your only problem. You need to deal with that. And in God's mercy, you can deal with that today. And it's, you don't have to keep coming to church anymore. You don't have to read your Bible anymore. You, you've heard about it, right? Okay? So today, you can take a little bit of time with the creator of the universe that wants to hear from you and just say, God, I'm so sorry. And I'm in such a mess. And I can't get my way out of it. And I desperately want your salvation. That could be today. 
you have been redeemed, right? Let's keep going. Am I sharing my story with other people? Let's get back to the beginning of the psalm. What did he say here? Has the Lord redeemed you? Then what? Speak out. Tell somebody. (laughs) Dwell on that instead of all the rest of the chaos in the world right now. Remember that, right? Because as And we need to tell each other these stories so that as other people hear these things, they can be encouraged and say, yes, God, God is in charge. And it's not just chaos out there, right? God has amazing plans. And I don't get to choose what they are. God does. But they're not for my hurt. They're for my benefit. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. Psalm 107, 2 and 3. One more slide. Hmm. (laughs) Don't keep it to yourself. Tell the world. So I'm going to challenge you. Maybe maybe you saw yourself in those those four stories from the Psalms here. I saw myself in a couple of them, right? And if you did, tell somebody. Say, yeah, God redeemed me. Maybe that needs to happen today at lunch. You just recount that with your family. Maybe that needs to happen with your coworker. You just need to say, man, I just need to tell you something about the mess I was in. Right? Maybe that needs to be that greeter at Walmart or the person at Speedway or whoever else. Right? Maybe it's your neighbor next door. Instead of complaining about that goofy tree that's hanging over the yard and how it's dropping the leaves on your yard and it's making a mess and killing your grass. Maybe instead of talking about that, you can talk about how God redeemed you, right? And maybe it's you talking to God a little bit and saying, God, remind me of the times that you have redeemed me because you know what? I've taken them for granted and I've let them flow by. And I'm not praising you Because I'm forgetting about all the times that you have redeemed me. And so maybe you just need to be sitting down yourself and say, Holy Spirit, help me. Remember these times. Remember these times. I'm going to ask the worship team if you guys will come back up. Let me pray for us. Because we're stewards of today. God gave us, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Like I said, I sure hope BBS is happening tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. But I know I got today. I have today to tell the redemptive story of what God has done in my life. You have today to tell the redemptive story of what God has done in your life. Maybe it's taking a little time, remembering those stories, and then tell somebody today, somebody, find somebody today to tell that to. Maybe you just need to tell somebody before you leave church today. That'd be a great thing too. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a God of reconciliation. You are a God of redemption. You are there to transform us from being lost and without hope and in despair to folks that are part of your family and have eternal hope and eternal privilege of being with you and being restored by you. God, help us never to stop being in awe of what you have done in our lives. And God, I pray for folks that if they're just being honest with you, they say, I, man, I, that ain't me. I haven't done that. If that's you right now, you can say, God, I'm lost. And I need, I need to be redeemed. And God, I accept the payment of your son to get me out of that pawn shop of Satan. And I want to be part of your family. And I thank you for that. And you know what? It happens just like that because there's nothing else. It's his work. It's not yours. You just need to humble yourself and accept that. God, help us to find things to praise you about every day and to announce to everyone around us about your redemption of us every day, Father. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.